Hello, hello and welcome to a bit of mystery and also comedy, a detective story, a Sherlock Holmes story, not. It's a parody of a Sherlock Holmes story written by one of the most innovative and original American writers of his generation, William Sidney Porter, better known under his pen name O. Henry. Many of his witty and ironic short stories are considered classics of American literature. Porter was born in Greensboro, North Carolina, and was a bit of a jack of all trades. He had a varied career as a pharmacist, journalist, bank clerk, and also became known as a fugitive. He was accused of embezzlement, fled to Honduras, but returned to face trial when his wife became ill. He was sentenced to prison, and in prison, he began writing stories under his pseudonym, O. Henry. After his release, he moved to New York and became a popular and prolific writer who was admired by many of his contemporaries such as George Bernard Shaw, H.G. Wells and T.S. Eliot. O. Henry's writing style was influenced by the works of writers like Edgar Allan Poe, Rudyard Kipling and Leo Tolstoy and he himself influenced many later writers such as Ernest Hemingway, William Faulkner and Ray Bradbury. O. Henry's legacy contains more than 600 stories, very often rich in vivid descriptions, dialects and symbolisms. He explored themes such as fear, courage, love and fate, and many of his stories had surprising twist endings. O. Henry has been honored with a literary award himself and a short story award, the O. Henry Award, the only yearly award given to short stories of exceptional merit, was named after him. The Penn O. Henry Price Stories is an annual collection of the year's 20 best stories published in the US and Canadian magazines, and even the museum, a stamp, and the school were named after him. O. Henry's characters and plots have become part of the popular imagination. His stories are still widely read and appreciated today, and so O. Henry's influence and legacy are evident in many aspects of American culture. His probably most well-known story is The Gift of the Magi, a Christmas story that has unsurprisingly for O. Henry, a surprise ending and that I will certainly read during Christmas time. Today it's, as mentioned, a parody of a Sherlock Holmes story titled The Adventures of Shamrock Jones. And yes, there will be a real Sherlock Holmes story soon on this channel. And if you want to, let me know which Sherlock Holmes story you'd want me to read. One of the, the shorter ones or one of the longer ones? Is there a specific story you prefer or that you want to hear? Put it in the comments. With all that having said, let's start with The Adventures of Shamrock Jones who demonstrates his unbelievable talent of deduction to his faithful companion, What's Up? An incredibly funny spoof of Arthur Conan Doyle's Master Detective. I am so fortunate as to count Shamrock Jones, the great New York detective among my muster of friends. Jones is what is called the inside man of the city detective force. He is an expert in the use of the typewriter and 
It is his duty, whenever there is a murder mystery to be solved, to sit at a desk telephone at headquarters and take down the messages of cranks who phone in their confessions to having committed the crime. But on certain off days, when confessions are coming in slowly and three or four newspapers have run to earth as many different guilty persons, Jones will knock about the town with me exhibiting to my great delight and instruction his marvelous powers of observation and deduction. The other day I dropped in at headquarters and found the great detective gazing thoughtfully at a string that was tied tightly around his little finger. Good morning. What's up? he said, without turning his head. I am glad to notice that you have had your house fitted up with electric lights. At last. Will you please tell me, I said in surprise, how you knew that? I am sure that I never mentioned the fact to anyone, and the wiring was a rush order not completed until this morning. Nothing easier, said Jones genially. As you came in, I caught the odor of the cigar you are smoking. I know an expensive cigar, and I know that not more than three men in New York can afford to smoke cigars and pay gas bills, too, at the present time. That was an easy one. But I'm working just now on a little problem of my own. Why have you that string on your finger? I asked. That's... The problem, said Jones. My wife tied that on this morning to remind me of something I was to send up to the house. Sit down, what's up, and excuse me for a few moments. The distinguished detective went to a wall telephone and stood with the receiver to his ear for probably ten minutes. Were you... Listening to a confession, I asked, when he had returned to his chair. Perhaps, said Jones, with a smile. It might be called something of the sort. To be frank with you, what's up? I've cut out the dope. I've been increasing the quantity for so long that morphine doesn't have much effect on me anymore. I've got to have something... More powerful. That telephone I just went to is connected with a room in the Waldorf, where there's an author's reading in progress. Now, to get at the solution of this string. After five minutes of silent pondering, Jones looked at me with a smile and nodded his head. Wonderful man, I exclaimed. Already? It is quite simple, he said, holding up his finger. You see that knot? That is to prevent my forgetting. It is therefore a forget-me-not. A forget-me-not is a flower? It was a sack of flour that I was to send home. Beautiful! I could not help crying out in admiration. Suppose we go out for a ramble, suggested Jones. There is only one case of importance on hand just now. Old man McCarthy, a hundred and four years old, died from eating too many bananas. The evidence points so strongly to the mafia that the police have surrounded the Second Avenue Hudson Yammer Grambinus Club Number no. 2, and the capture of the assassin is only a matter of a few hours. The detective force has not yet been called on for assistance. 
Jones and I went out and up the street toward the corner where we were to catch a surface car. Halfway up the block we met Rheingelde, an acquaintance of ours who held a city hall position. Good morning, Rheingelde, said Jones, halting. Nice breakfast that was you had this morning. Always on the lookout for the detective's remarkable feats of deduction, I saw Jones' eye flash for an instant upon a long yellow splash on the shirt bosom and a smaller one upon the chin of Rheingelder, both undoubtedly made by the yolk of an egg. Oh, that is some of your detectiveness said Rheingelder, shaking all over with a smile. Well, I pet you drinks and cigars all round, that you cannot tell what I have eaten for breakfast. Done, said Jones, sausage, pumpernickel, and coffee. Rheingelder admitted the correctness of the surmise and paid the bet. When we had proceeded on our way, I said to Jones, I thought you looked at the egg spilled on his chin and shirt front. I did, said Jones. That is where I began my deduction. Rheingelder is a very economical saving man. Yesterday eggs dropped in the market to 28 cents per dozen. Today they are quoted at 42. Rheingelder ate eggs yesterday and today he went back to his usual fare. A little thing like this isn't anything. What's up? It belongs to the primary arithmetic class. When we boarded the street car, we found the seats all occupied principally by ladies. Jones and I stood on the rear platform. About the middle of the car there sat an elderly man with a short grey beard who looked to be the typical well-dressed New Yorker. At successive corners other ladies climbed the board and soon three or four of them were standing over the man, clinging to straps and glaring meaningly at the man who occupied the coveted seat. But he resolutely retained his place. We New Yorkers, I remarked to Jones, have about lost our manners as far as the exercise of them in public goes. Perhaps so, said Jones lightly, but the man you evidently refer to happens to be a very chivalrous and courteous gentleman from old Virginia. He is spending a few days in New York with his wife and two daughters, and he leaves for the South tonight. You know him, then, I said in amazement. I never saw him before we stepped on the car, declared the detective smilingly. By the gold tooth of the witch of Endor, I cried, if you can construe all that from his appearance, you are dealing in nothing else than black art. The habit of observation, nothing more, said Jones. If the old gentleman gets off the car before we do, I think I can demonstrate to you the accuracy of my deduction. Three blocks farther along, the gentleman rose to leave the car. Jones addressed him at the door. Pardon me, sir, but are you not Colonel Hunter of Norfolk, Virginia? No, sir, was the extremely courteous answer. My name, sir, is Allison. Major Winfield R. Allison from Fairfax County in the same state. I know a good many people, sir, in Norfolk, the Goodriches, the Tollivers, and the Crap Tree, sir, but I never had the pleasure of meeting your friend Colonel Hunter. I am happy to say, sir, that I am going back to Virginia tonight after having spent a week in your city with my wife and three daughters. I shall be in Norfolk in about ten days, and if you will give me your name, sir, I will take pleasure in looking up Colonel Hunter and telling him that you inquired after him, sir. Thank you, 
Sir John's. Tell him that Reynolds sent his regards, if you will be so kind. I glanced at the great New York detective and saw that a look of intense chagrin had come upon his clear-cut features. Failure in the slightest point always galled Shamrock Johns. Did you say your three daughters? He asked of the Virginia gentleman. Yes, sir, my three daughters, all as fine girls as there are in Fairfax County, was the answer. With that, Major Allison stopped the car and began to descend the step. Shamrock Jones clutched his arm. One moment, sir, he begged in an urbane voice in which I alone detected the anxiety. Am I not right in believing that one of the young ladies is an adopted daughter? You are, sir, admitted the major from the ground. But how the devil you knew it, sir, is more than I can tell. And more than I can tell, too, I said, as the car went on. Jones was restored to his calm, observant serenity by having wrestled victory from his apparent failure. So, after we got off the car, he invited me into a café, promising to reveal the process of his latest wonderful feat. In the first place, he began after we were comfortably seated. I knew the gentleman was no New Yorker because he was flushed and uneasy and restless on account of the ladies that were standing, although he did not rise and give them his seat. I decided from his appearance that he was a southerner rather than a westerner. Next, I began to figure out his reason for not relinquishing his seat to a lady when he evidently felt strongly but not overpoweringly impelled to do so. I very quickly decided upon that. I noticed that one of his eyes had received a severe jab in the corner, which was red and inflamed, and that all over his face were tiny round marks about the size of the end of an uncut lead pencil. Also, upon both of his patent leather shoes were a number of deep imprints shaped like oval cuts off square at one end. Now, there is only one district in New York City where a man is bound to receive scars and wounds and indentations of that sort, and that is along the sidewalks of 23rd Street and a portion of 6th Avenue south of there. I knew from the imprints of trampling French heels on his feet and the marks of countless jabs in the face from umbrellas and parasols carried by women in the shopping district that he had been in conflict with the Amazonian troops. And as he was a man of intelligent appearance, I knew he would not have braved such dangers unless he had been dragged thither by his own women folk. Therefore, when he got on the car, his anger at the treatment he had received was sufficient to make him keep his seat in spite of his traditions of southern chivalry. That is all very well, I said. But why did you insist upon daughters, and especially two daughters? Why couldn't a wife alone have taken him shopping? There had to be daughters, said Jones calmly, if he had only a wife, and she knew his own age. He could have bluffed her into going alone. If he had a young wife, she would prefer to go alone. So, there you are. I'll admit that, I said. But now, why two daughters? And how, in the name of all the prophets, did you guess that one was adopted when he told you he had three? Don't say guess, 
said Jones, with a touch of pride in his air. There is no such word in the lexicon of ratiocination. In Major Ellison's buttonhole there was a carnation and a rosebud backened by a geranium leaf. No woman ever combined a carnation and a rosebud into a buttonier. Close your eyes, what's up, and give the logic of your imagination a chance. Cannot you see the lovely Adele fastening the carnation to the lapel so that Papa may be gay upon the street? And then the romping Edith May dancing up with sisterly jealousy to add her rosebud to the adornment? And then, I cried, beginning to feel enthusiasm, when he declared that he had three daughters, I could see, said Jones, one in the background who added no flower, and I knew that she must be adopted, I broke in. I give you every credit, but how did you know he was leaving for the South tonight? In his breast pocket, said the great detective, Something large and oval made a protuberance. Good liquor is scare on trains, and it is a long journey from New York to Fairfax County. Again, I must bow to you, I said. And tell me this, so that my last shred of doubt will be cleared away. Why did you decide that he was from Virginia? It was very faint, I admit answered Chemrock Johns, but no trained observer could have failed to detect the odor of mint in the car. <laughs> 